Hi, and welcome to the Climate Minute, your source for insight and perspective on global warming news. My name is Ted McIntyre, and this show is for the week of January 15th, 2021. Today we're joined by our co-host, the author and educator, Ms. Mariah Tinger. How are you doing, Mariah? I am doing well, and I am very delighted that we're going to be joined tonight by Betsy Rosenberg. Betsy is an award-winning national broadcast journalist and environmental media expert. She wears many hats, including environmental media host, producer, writer, speaker, climate communicator. Um, Through her radio shows, EcoTalk and The Green Front, she's interviewed the best and brightest in the climate community, including Catherine Hayhoe, Bill McKibben, James Hansen, Al Gore, Elizabeth Colbert. Michael Brune, to name a few. Betsy herself is a world-class solutions-oriented visionary, and we are thrilled to have her on her show, our show today. Welcome, Betsy. Thanks so much for having me. Truly a delight. Looking forward to this. Great. Well, so we wanted to jump in and talk a little bit about climate coverage in the media. And you've been looking at this for longer than anyone, I think. And so what <laughs> what have you experienced in your quest to bring more environmental news to mainstream broadcast and cable? Well, let's see. I started in the age of the di- of the dinosaur, and now I talk about dinosaurs. So that's a long stretch. <laughs> <laughs> really, it seems like it's been a long time. I, I started Green Minutes back last century, 1997, and it's been an uphill battle. Last millennia. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So where shall I start? Where shall we start? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, it, you know, as, as you've been trying to bring green news to the media, what have you found what's gotten in your way? Everything. Um, I call it bring, trying to bring green content and consciousness to the public. And it should never have been this difficult. I, I should say that I still have yet to break through the, what I call the green ceiling. We hear about the glass ceiling. The green ceiling is twice as thick. You see women on television. We've got blacks and browns. Where are the greens? Why are there so few environmental reporters or climate correspondents or designated, you know, green contributors on any of the television networks? I'm going to focus most of my comments on radio and television because that's my background. Um, We can have another conversation about social media, newspapers, magazines. But for most of the 23 years that I've been trying to get this kind of programming with the solutions focused on a mainstream network, which is where I grew up, on CBS Radio News, um, it's just been ridiculous. And I've heard every excuse in the book, and none of them are legitimate. And even after all these years, as they have fewer and fewer reasons to say, you know, our viewers or listeners are not interested, I, I, I always challenge that, because I had a show on Air America from 2004 to 2007 that was the late, great liberal network that lasted about three and a half years, poorly run, but had some great great hosts, including Rachel Maddow, ever heard of her, and Al Franken and Janine Garofalo. And uh, many of them went on to fame and fortune. I I happened to pick the green beach, so still in the red. But any day now that (laughs) that will change. So it's just been like, there's no legitimate reason, given that this is the biggest story. These are the biggest stories. It is newsworthy for them to give it short shrift all the time. You know, it used to be barely there. Now maybe it's an occasional side dish. Why is the future of our planet and humanity, not a main meal, at least one hour a week when every other hour is politics, pandemic, police brutality, rinse and repeat. Not that those issues are not important, but there's no good any of that on a bad planet. What do you think the costs of that failure are? Uh, Our future, our children's future. I mean, the costs are endless and we won't know fully, will we, till, you know, years, decades down the road, but we can imagine, right? Because look what happens when people are not aware of what's actually happening. We get people who are in active denial. We get people who are just downplaying the problem. And of course, it it starts at the top, the government, uh, administrations, uh, industry, special interest groups, but it's also a complacent public that might not be so complacent if the dots were connected on a more regular basis. And if not only the challenges, the threats, which are happening much faster than scientists had predicted, um, but there's no programming on solutions. So of course they're going to show if they're even able to gauge what happens when they mention climate change for seven seconds, they claim ratings go down. I say, how, how do you even catch that in seven seconds? I challenge all that. Um, if they don't, if they only give, you know, sea levels are rising and how many parts per million greenhouse gases we have in the atmosphere, it's scary and people just get paralyzed. And so, of course, they're going to get depressed and tune out and not want to hear it. 
if you combine it with solutions, which somehow even in my green minutes, I had the problem solution, a 20 second soundbite. That's how I learned to talk fast. I mean, that's simplifying it, but why not talk about both? It's not either or, but now that mother nature has been screaming, stop ignoring me. Um, I think they cannot say that they're, you know, going to ignore it. They have to respond to it. So what I'm trying to do now is get ahead of it and say, okay, so people are aware we got a problem. All the research shows that Americans do want more information on climate science and what we can do about it. Why are they still resisting? And I think they're afraid, <laughs> frankly, of, of alienating. Betsy, can I do, just jump in and ask, ask this question? Do you think, what do you think is the relative weighting of, say, the advertiser money that fuels cable TV versus the sort of, I think this appetite for sensational, immediate things that can be grasped, you know, if it bleeds, it leads kind of thing, where most climate stuff doesn't quite do that until it's a disaster. Do, are those related? Do you think, is that the, I mean, I guess I'm searching for the reason why there's this paucity of coverage. And is right. it because they're afraid to put it on or is it because the audience has been trained to reject it? Yes, yes, and yes. I think it's all of the above. Uh -huh. um, I mean, I wish I knew for sure, but I have been trying to get that question answered, you know, relentlessly. And what I think after all these years um, is that it's part, let's say maybe a third of it is, they don't want to alienate their, you know, American Petroleum Institute advertisers, coal, gas, oil, uh, which are on fairly regularly, even still. I think it's partly because they don't know what they don't know. These are the news programmers, the executives, where they really don't understand quite how urgent and complex these issues are, or maybe they do when they think it's too complex, but either way, if they really knew what we know, <laughs> they would not be able to ignore it legitimately. So it's partly that. And they also don't know how interesting and compelling and popular this programming could be. When my show was on back in 2004, five, six, I had no marketing budget. I was paying for the production myself. We had 40,000 listeners a night and the show was so popular. It went from weekly to daily. Imagine now when the problems are that much more obvious and you know there was a marketing budget if it was on a cnn or something where you could get that support so it's partly the advertising it's partly not wanting to alienate their viewers i guess a lot of people go back and forth between cnn because that's the one place where i actually did get meetings and got close um because people then will you know, they'd rather hear that it's not a problem or not hear about it at all even better uh so it's partly that and and then there's this there's maybe a quarter of it is this question mark that i still haven't quite gotten my finger on, but I'm still trying to find out like well, why. Well, tell me this. So, so in my experience, maybe you have a similar experience, uh, the sort of culture war aspect of climate change, where it became a sort of a political uh, article of faith on one side of the, you know, on the, shall we say the other side of the spectrum, right? That occurred probably sometime during the Obama era, I would say. And that prior politicization of climate change, I think it's no, no, not quite politicization. But I mean, when McCain ran in 2008, he was a Republican. He had a plan, right? He and Joe Lieberman had the McCain climate. So it was not like completely anathema to talk about climate change if you're a Republican. But then it became so because McCain changed his mind as right, if you but can. In, and then so through t t like it, but so but the, I guess my the question I'm heading for is what role do you think that sort of the efforts at denialism which float around the outside and sort of the culture have educated the audience to reject the message from cable and therefore reinforces this cycle where, you know, Chris Hayes doesn't want to put anything on talk about climate change because it's a ratings killer kind of thing. Too political. Well, it got politicized and it never should have been it. I mean, it's the ultimate practical matter, right? Our it's physics, it's science, mm -hmm. it's our survival. Um, and it, it, the Republicans, had, they, I think they should take all the blame for that. I don't think that Democrats started that. Republicans did. And of course, that was just the beginning of some other things that they've lied about. It's the big, talk about the big lie. This is the biggest lie of all because they have somehow been able to convince half of America or close who you wouldn't, again, if you understood the truth, truth threats, you would not vote for a science denier. And 73 million just did again, even after all the wildfires and floods and hurricanes from hell, you know, uh, fire NATO is we've got new language for these mm. you know, mega storms. So I just think that they've, they've been very successful. And unfortunately, it's going to be a failure of our ability to really turn this ship around because we're like, even if there wasn't denial, even if they weren't lying, and they still are, by the way, on climate change, uh, maybe because no one's really challenging that piece of their big lie. 
Uh, we, we still have such an uphill battle. Like it, it's, it's epic what we have to do. And it's not just climate, it's oceans, it's food, energy, every, everything, you know, biodiversity, extinction. We have so ecosystems are collapsing. You know, how do you fix that? Well, it's such a big job that it's, it is overwhelming, but it's really impossible as long as we have this denial always in there because it affects information getting out there to the masses. It affects action. And it, it gives people an excuse to do nothing. And yeah, some of it was industry, some public interests, special interest groups, but we've also allowed the public to kind of tune it out because there's too many who will tell them it's not real or cast doubt just enough so they don't have to change their habits. God forbid. I, you know, so, um, I think if you, I think we could do a whole show. And in fact, we should do a whole show about misinformation and disinformation, because I think that's a huge piece of it. Um, yes. But just to follow up on, you know, you were mentioning some of the reasons why people, why climate's not being covered. And is some part of it possibly the complexity of the science? Maybe people are hesitant to speak about it because they feel like, I don't really understand it. And so I don't want to say anything because then I might look, you know, uninformed or whatever it is. Yes, and that's exactly why we need a daily, if not 24-7, Green News Network, a GNN, to have these discussions. We can't do it in 20-second sound bites. We can't even do it, like my dream is to get, you know, an hour a week to talk about this stuff and have all the experts come on. I'm not an expert. I'm an expert in the experts, so I know who to call on every shade of green A to Z after doing it for so many years and so many interviews. But we, it, it just can't be a quick and easy fix. It's just not that. You know, it's our, it's our life support system. And so that's, that makes the argument for programming. It is complicated. There's no simple anything about it. But if we're not having those conversations and we have to reduce our emissions by half, you know, it's now nine years from now and some even say seven years. How are we going to do that if we're not having a national conversation? So that there's really no one can give me a good enough reason where I'll say, okay, we, we don't need it. Everything they can say is like exactly why. So I'm told all the time, well, we're busy with Trump news and it's all political. We just can't get to the planet stuff. Sorry, Betsy. I say, and it's always going to be that way. There's always going to be, if it bleeds, it leads. Well, the planet is bleeding. It's the, you know breaking news. What about a broken climate? That's why we need its own designated place on a mainstream platform. That's what's key, reaching the millions, the masses who still don't understand what's going on. I have a question. So, so one of the things that I have in my head, a con this concept about the news in the one of the issues with climate change is that it, the topic has been siloed, as they say, to coin a phrase, right? It's in, it is relegated to a segment, you know, if you get a segment, there's a segment off to the side. Uh, there's a, I think there's a pretty good argument that climate change affects everything and that it should be in every news cast. Uh, do you have an, I, I mean, what's your opinion? I mean, I, I certainly think an hour dedicated to integrating climate change into all the other news, right? Or somehow putting it into perspective. Would you agree that that's a good way to go? Or how do you deal with the, the question of, uh, you know, an hour a week uh, that you get to talk about climate and then the rest of the time is just completely ignored? Would that be, no, make you happy? No, it needs really truly 24 seven. And it's not, again, it's not just climate. Climate makes, is the, the great exacerbator, the mother of all our environmental problems, but it's not the only one. And you have to provide the context. And so it's both. Yes, you need, let's start with an hour a week where people who do want to know, and there's millions of them can tune in and, and learn and, and see a very, not boring, not gloom and doom, but an exciting dynamic. You, you guys know people who are, you know, into the environmental, you know, movement for lack of a better term are the most passionate, optimistic, crazy people I know. Cause every day we get up thinking today's the day we're going to get people to wake up and smell the carbon. So let's start with, you know, designated programming. And yes, it also has to be infiltrated through health economy, security, all the issues. And that's why the New York times, cause I've been doing this long enough to remember when they killed their environmental desk and we were like going, why? And they said, well, they were going to just spread it out among other departments it kind of did, kind of didn't, not enough. Um, and then several years later, it's like somebody woke up and said, oh my God, this is this is the most important beat. And they have a climate unit now. And there's like 12, 15 people working on it as it should be. So it needs to be both. It needs to be everywhere. I mean, we, we have so much catching up to do because we've kicked the carbon can down this, the road so long. We are so, you know, up a creek. <laughs> So the uh, uh, well, uh, Bessie, this has been fantastic chatting. 
Uh, we need to stop at this point. What we'll do is we'll put up links to your website and other interesting connections uh, uh, regarding this discussion of where does the media fit into all of our, uh, our the solution here. Uh, Thank you. you can find the blog at massclimateaction.org slash blog. Uh, if you have a question, please, about anything, especially if you want to tell us what shows we ought to be having, send us an email to podcast at massclimateaction.net. Let us know what's going on. Of course, you can listen to the show on your smartphone using Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, et cetera, et cetera. Please ask your friends to listen to the Climate Minute. Recommend it to them because they can listen to it on their favorite podcast distribution app. We want to thank our good friend D.R. Tucker for his continuing research support. We want to close where we always close by saying that because we recognize the necessity of personal accountability for our actions, because we accept responsibility for building a durable future, because we believe it's our patriotic duty as citizens to speak out, we have to insist that the United States transform its energy sector over the next decade under a just and equitable plan that uses regulation, investment, and a price on carbon to safeguard our future. So, Betsy, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Remember, the future is green or not at all. (laughs) Mariah, thank you so much for being here. Always a pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for listening. We'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Very cool. Ha, 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 ha.